Okay, well, it's just gone just half past the hour. So um, my name is Chris Griffiths and welcome to uh, this week's edition of ESDR Kitchen, which is our uh, ESDR live Zoom webinars, which we started back in um, July. And uh, as you'll see here, we have four thematic tracks. Uh, the one we're going to cover today is the recipe book, where we talk about new research techniques. Um, sweet and sour is where two um, experts in a field discuss a hot topic, um, not in an antagonistic way or debate, but in a scientific discourse. Freshly baked is where we're taking, you know, just recently published papers in the scientific journals, um, a couple each time to discuss uh, in detail what those uh, uh, papers show, and they're usually headed up by the first author of those papers. And then molecular cuisine is where a, an established senior investigator in uh, European dermatology takes us through his or her uh, pathway to discovery. Um, so as the next slide uh, shows, uh, we have back to the recipe book today, and I'm very pleased that we have Patrick Brunner, who's going to talk about RNA-seq to study uh, skin. And with that, I'm going to hand over to one of my two um, moderators today, um, uh, Julian Seneschal, who's also joined by Enrico um, Sonkali, and uh, uh, Julian is going to introduce Patrick. So. Over to you, Julian. Thank you, Griff. Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, new ESDR Kitchen webinar. So I'm Julian Seneschal from Bordeaux, and I'm in company with my colleague, uh, board colleague, uh, Eniko Sonkoli, to open the recipe book. And uh, it's our great pleasure to welcome uh, our guest, Patrick Brunner, who will discuss about this RNA sequencing uh, to be applied uh, for research in dermatology. So just a few words to introduce Patrick. Patrick uh, is an associate professor of dermatology at the Department of Dermatology uh, at the Medical Uni University of Vienna, Austria. And as a clinician, uh, he's seeing patients is really interesting in chronic inflammatory skin disorder and see uh, patients affected with psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, alopecia areata, and also cutaneous lymphoma. But then after his uh, residency, uh, he moved to New York and joined uh, the Laboratory of Investigative Dermatology at the Rockefeller University under the guidance of uh, Dr. Emma Gutmann and uh, Dr. James Kruger. And then he moved back to uh, Vienna and built his own research uh, lab, focusing his research on chronic inflammatory skin disease and also cutaneous lymphoma. And to better understand how individual immune cells orchestrate uh, the skin inflammation. So, before, just a few words from my colleague, Eniko. Yes, thank you, Julian. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Eniko Schonkoy from Karolinska, Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, I am also very pleased to welcome you all who listened to this episode of the recipe book. And before I hand over to Patrick, I would just say that uh, you are very welcome to ask questions. And you can submit your questions in the Q&A section. And please do that anytime uh, during the presentation. We will take the questions after uh, Patrick's presentation. So please, Patrick Brunner, please share your screen. All right, thank you so much for um, having me here. I'm very honored that I, um, uh, for the possibility to present, I think one of the hottest topics in biomedical research concerning the analysis of tissues, which is single cell RNA sequencing, which is I think a perfect means to um, study, uh, study skin because skin is uh, readily um, accessible. And, um, and uh, usually you only need a small amount. So with a regular skin biopsy, you get a ton of information out of the skin. And this is a quickly evolving field. So there's not really a gold standard um, to, um, to uh, do all the analysis. There are certain recommendations and the next few years will um, show um, how this field, um, how this field will um, advance. Let me just, all right. So these are my disclosures. 
So when you analyze tissue and you do bulk analysis, you get the bulk um, RNA um, out of the tissue, and then you get a single value um, or an average gene expression that is derived from all cells. And you don't really know whether it derives from the blue cell or the yellow cell or the green cell, but this is not possible due to single cell analysis, where you get a transcriptome for ideally each and every cell within the tissue, and then you get individual uh, gene expression for each cell. And with complex bioinformatics um, tools and machine learning algorithms, you can really get, um, get information out of, of, of the skin at, it, um, at an unprecedented um, depth. So how does this whole workflow um, work? So first, of course, you need to take a sample and then you do tissue dissociation and single cell isolation because you want to look at every cell separately. You can either um, sort, fuck sort, um, those cells into 96 well plate, one cell at the max, do limiting dilution at the maximum of one cell per well. And this you can then uh, analyze. This doesn't allow really a high throughput. Um, and for this, um, a droplet-based technique has been developed where you encircle or enclose um, at, at the maximum one cell, ideally, in one droplet. And this droplet contains all necessary tools, enzymes, to really then prepare this library and get a transcriptome out of every cell. Um, this works um, via, um, um, via um, a labeling of the cDNA libraries. Uh, via barcoding. And in order to sequence them, they are then all put together. Uh, so you can sequence it. Um, and this is called multiplexing. And then when you have all the sequences, you need to go back and um, demultiplex the tissue and the line, all the information that you got to a reference genome. And by this bioinformatics uh, um, steps, you can then trace back uh, the sequence that you got or, um, or the reads that you got back to individual cells. Um, so after processing the raw data, which is done via various pipelines with Cell Ranger, for example, you get a, a so-called count matrix, which means you get information on gene expression uh, per cell. But in order to make sure that you get something out that is biologically meaningful, there are several quality control steps that you need to do. And you might be a little bit less stringent at the beginning, see what you get, and go back and forth in order to um, allow, or in order to find um, differences that are biologic, that are putatively biologically meaningful, and that answer your uh, the question that you have. As I said, there's no gold standard for it. There um, are no clear guidelines. So there are. Uh, this is a quickly evolving field um, with multiple tools and um, you really need, I think, a dedicated bioinformatician or someone who does the bioinformatics part um, in order to um, see what's going on right now concerning, concerning the tools that are available. But the quality control when you get the data out, um, first of all, you want to, of course, ensure that all cellular barcode data, and like barcode refers to a single cell, really corresponds to viable cell because if all cells are dead, you don't want to look at dead cells and just uh, look at noise because you get a lot of data out and you want to make sure that you look at biological processes and not just noise. So one uh, measure of it is you can look at the count depth, which at the end of the day corresponds to the amount of mRNA you had in the cell. And when you um, get like this frequency um, uh, on the left, you see that you have a very low count depth uh, on, the, on the very left part, which means there's not much, um, not much information within the cell. And you can assume that these are dead cells. And then you need to do a cutoff here. There are no guidelines for it or, or, or recommendations. So you, you might need to be less stringent, as I said, at the beginning and then uh, go back and forth and see that you get the proper information out. And then, of course, you need to be careful that you really have one cell in one droplet, which means that you want to avoid um, uh, doublets. Uh, because if a T cell and the monocyte stick together, unless you have a certain um, question, uh, research question, it doesn't, it's not going to give you meaningful information. And this you also have on the number of genes that you find um, um, per cell. And here you have a little peak that might be just dead cells that you can cut out. And one good information about dead cells are, um, is the fraction of counts from mitochondrial genes. Because when a cell is damaged, 
and uh, the mRNA can or the information can leak out and only the uh, mitochondrial genes remain in the cell. So if there are only mitochondrial genes left, you might uh, filter this cell out because you're only gonna get information from a dead cell. And then there are several ways to look at this data. You can uh, see count depth versus a barcode rank. And here at the end, you get this sort of shoulder or knee that goes down um, concerning um, count depth. And here you need to then do a threshold in order not to, um, to exclude those damaged cells. And then you can combine different informations in order to do your quality control at this step. Then you uh, obtain a, a single cell data set that is still enormously um, complex. So the feature space for a single cell data set can have over 15,000 dimensions. And even when you filter out like zero count genes that are not regulated. And in order to, um, I mean, this is the basis where you then do differential gene expression and so on. But in order to see what's really going on, you need to bring it into a form that our brains can comprehend. So you have to reduce dimensionality. And there are several approaches um, to do this. Um, one usual one is feature selection, which means that you take highly variable genes and take it from there. And then you need to do dimensionality reduction. So you need to plot it in two dimensions um, and then you can visualize it. And um, I'm sure you all know what the principal component analysis is, where two, uh, PC1 versus PC2 gives you some information like uh, which you can greatly use for quality control purposes or when you look at batch effects and so on. But this doesn't give you enough complexity or visualize enough complexity for single cell RNA sequencing. And for this, you have this um, TS and E algorithm, which lots of people are using. And here in the middle, you have such a plot where one dot represents one cell with a transcriptome um, in it. And the cells that are closer together are more related to each other trans from a transcriptomic standpoint than those that are farther away. So the TS and E plot is great in order to find discrete differences between two cells. But like, um, um, like capturing, um, or it, it better captures local similarities, but this happens at an expense of sort of the global structure. So in other words, if you look at this like a map of a country, it will greatly capture like you and, and your neighbor down the street. But if you wanna compare two cities, it's not great to, to get this information. And um, for this, you can use the so-called UMAP plots, which better captures this global architecture. But it really depends on your research question, what you, what you, need, um, what you need to look at. Then you also need to do batch correction. One popular one, for example, is COMBAT. It's an algorithm, but there are many others. But just to look at the left side, when you don't do batch correction, uh, every color denotes an individual um, sample. And here you see that you only really see differences between the samples and which might be due to processing or a technical variation. And then you only see like um, batch effects or technical variation and not really the biology behind. And for this, there are complex algorithms where you can correct uh, for the batch in order to get more an even distribution. I mean, everything of course depends on the samples that you have and on the research question that you have to apply. And there's no like recipe for this. There are several tools available. But then you end up having this, um, these clusters uh, of cells where one circle is one individual cell and um, cells that um, are similar cluster to, together. And here, for example, it's an atopic dermatitis sample where you have fibroblasts and vascular endothelial cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, and so on. But how can you now know which cluster is what? So here you can do differential gene expression and see which gene is highly upregulated within one cluster in comparison to the rest of the data set. And when the top rank genes are keratin 1, 10, 14, you know it's keratinocytes. And this is how you then find out what cell, um, what cell is um, which, which cluster and therefore you can assign it. And it's always better to rank for full change and adjusted p-value because the p-value often is inflated and will not give you enough information by itself. But when you rank for full change and, and, um, and p-value and the top ranked um, genes will not be so much influenced by p-value um, inflation. 
And then you have an enormously complex um, data set, which means um, you can look at many, many things that you can't really look at in, in bark tissue. I mean, of course, you can always compare means of certain populations, but the mean doesn't give you information on variability, which you now have, you know, whether tissue is heterogeneous or very homo homogeneous. And then there's something that is pseudo time. And this is now a very interesting new variable um, because you have a complex tissue. You have thousands of uh, cells within a sample, ideally. And um, every cell will be a little bit different from the other one. And uh, with this, you can use to align cells that are very close together. At, uh, and, and then you sort of get a trajectory where you can infer potential biologic um, meaning, meanings out of it. So this trajectory analysis or this trajectory inferior, inference method um, interprets single cell data as a snapshot of a continuous process. And here, as I said, the pseudo time variable. So this uses paths through cellular space that minimize transcriptional changes between neighboring cells. So as I said, very similar ones together, very far away. Um, farther down. And with this, for example, you can then look at keratinocytes and suddenly you can see changes from basal keratinocytes, proliferating keratinocytes down to dif more differentiated um, suprabasal keratinocytes. Um, this, of course, only captures transcriptomic differences. Yeah, It does not necessarily represent any biological process. And you need to make sure that you do not only look at noise, which always, which there's always a level of noise, but um, um, you can uh, sometimes get, uh, I think it's a very promising tool, but I think, but it's uh, highly recommended that you then, of course, um, validate it in a biological experiment or in a different um, data set as with other uh, means so that you're not only looking at noise or artifacts. So what I told you so far are like cell-based um, analysis. Uh, like this clustering, trajectory, inference, and others. And then you can look at individual um, cells, of course, uh, not at individual cells, at individual genes. And you can do differential um, gene expression. And often it's displayed like in this volcano plot, where you usually take a negative uh, log fold change of the adjust p-value. And high up means highly significant. And down uh, left means down. Uh, right means upregulated, and you can do gene set analysis. You can do gene regulatory networks, and the, I mean the, the possibilities are really um, seem unlimited. So we ourselves asked the question: How can we better characterize the topic dermatitis? And um, we used this um, single cell RNA seq approach from Skin. But patients were very unhappy donating biopsies because it's painful and they have been biopsied in the past and uh, they f they're going to get a scar and they have to come back again for removing the sutures. So there's actually a very old technique of so-called skin suction blistering uh, where you have a negative pressure chamber put on your skin um, and uh, this negative pressure is uh, is there for like two, one or two hours. And during this time, which is relatively, which is painless, um, which I can tell you, this is my arm, um, you get formation of uh, little blisters. And the blister roof represents the epidermis. And this blister is filled with fluid, with tissue fluid that contains both proteins from the skin as well as cells from the skin. And, um, and with this method, you can both harvest blister fluid and take the supernatant for um, proteomic analysis, for example. And you can take the epidermis, the blister roof, as well as the cells that are pelleted from the blister uh, fluid, sort it or enrich it or directly use it for single cell RNA sequencing. And we were looking at it in comparison to skin biopsies, full thing, the skin biopsies, in order to find out um, whether this suction blister um, method represents the cell that you get with the like skin gold standard, which is truly the skin biopsy. So when we compared biopsy from a biopsies from atopic dermatitis with blisters from atopic dermatitis, we, um, we saw that most cells that you get from the biopsy, like keratinocytes, T cells, myeloid cells, uh, and melanocytes, you also get with blister AD. Interestingly enough, um, melanocytes were really, um, uh, we got a lot of mel melanocytes out from this, um, even more than with uh, biopsies. And of course, you're not going to get endothelial cells or smooth muscle cells or fibroblasts 
or also like more tissue resident cells that don't move a lot like mast cells or really sticky macrophages that are deeper down the dermis, you're not gonna get those cells, but most cells are readily captured both from the epidermis as well as from the blister fluid where we think some cells are migrating in. So now we compared this biopsy and the blister and, uh, and we didn't see many differences uh, here in this heat map, for example. But one interesting thing that we saw was when you look at this inflammatory uh, keratin, keratin 6A, which is actually absent from healthy control samples, we nicely found them in keratinocytes of uh, blister samples, as it is expected because produced by keratinocytes. But when we looked at the biopsy sample, we also found a high signal, red here means high expression, in keratinocytes. But we got this hazy low level um, signal also in other cells like T cells, dendritic cells and others. And it seems that um, blister formation is more gentle than biopsy processing. Um, especially when you combine it with uh, flow cytometric cell sorting as we did in order to enrich for leukocytes. So the resolution was better in our hands and the quality of the cell was better in blisters than with biopsies in this experiment. Other uh, markers were quite different between biopsy and blister. You find IL-13 in T cells, IL-22, um, a little bit of IL-5, a little bit of interferon gamma and others. Interestingly enough, interleukin-10 was mainly produced by myeloid cells and not so much by T cells. And then you can visualize, so do, you have various ways to visualize the data that you have. You can do a heat map where, you, where every line represents a single cell. And here you can, of course, nicely see heterogeneity within a sample. Um, and then you can decide whether you downsize it so that every column is the same or whether you truly show all the cells that you captured. This gives you the, the wideness of the column. You can also do dot plots where um, the average expression is marked in red. So red means high average expression and the percent of expressed within a cluster, like um, the number of regulatory T cells that express a certain gene, you can also visualize. And then of course you can do the feature plot Gray means no expression, red means high expression. And here you see differences between like healthy controls and atopic dermatitis for inflammatory mediators and myeloid cells or CCL17, which is an important disease activity marker for atopic dermatitis. So we did not only get um, single cell RNA sequencing data from cells, we also had the, um, the blister fluid that we send off for proteomic analysis. And for this, we used uh, ProSig multiplex assay by Olink, because this is a very elegant uh, method to analyze proteins because you only need a few microliters to analyze hundreds of, um, hundreds of proteins. Uh, it's based on an antibody assay. So you have an antibody pair that binds to your target and every antibody is linked to a synthetic DNA strand. And when those antibodies bind, the DNA hybridizes and then indirectly via quantitative PCR, you get protein abundance in your sample. And for us, it was very useful because as I said, you only get little like 50 microliters or so or 100 microliters out of a patient doing the suction blistering. So um, with this, we had uh, really enough because from one patient, you would not even have enough sample for an ELISA, but here you can truly look at hundreds of markers. And this is what we did. Uh, here we looked at eight atopic dermatitis patients and eight healthy control patients. And you see that there's lots of heterogeneity within atopic dermatitis, but still many of these inflammatory markers are upregulated in atopic dermatitis, as you see with red and yellow color uh, compared to healthy control. And then you can put your data into a, or visualize it with a volcano plot. And here you see upregulation of many markers in atopic dermatitis compared to healthy controls such as CCL13 as expected. And then you can go back again and the markers that are upregulated on the protein level, you can check on your single cell data, which cells express it. And here you see that, for example, most markers were expressed by dendritic cells in atopic dermatitis that we found in our sample. So with this slide, I would like to conclude. I think, I hope I have convinced you that there are lots of benefits to this um, method. There are of course also limitations. Of course, this is an expensive uh, method, like one sample can cost up to $5,000. Um, and um, and um, 
of course, you need a whole pipeline that is ready to process your sample. You need a core facility that can process. You need a technician that knows what he or she does. And then I think you really need a person um, full-time dedicated to do the bioinformatics analysis and be really on, on top of things that are going on, like with all the many tools that are available that you can use and that you can um, choose from. And, um, and with this, I want to thank the many people that uh, are involved in this uh, project, um, especially my mentors, Emma Gutmann, Jim Krüger, and Georg Stingel, all the people from the lab, and especially the Leo Foundation that um, funded or that is funding my lab. Thanks a lot. And I'm very happy to take um, any questions. Yes, thank you very much for this excellent presentation and for making the technique of single cell RNA sequencing simple for us, for the audience. There are already a couple of questions. So I would like to start with uh, this question about, this is a technical question. So different algorithms produce, let's see, I just lost this. Different algorithms sometimes produce different results from the same data. So how do you decide which one to use? This is a very difficult question because you don't really know. I mean, you really need to infer it from the research question that you have. And I think you just need to validate it either with a different method or in a different data set. If you find a signature in a certain tumor and you think you have a mechanism, I think it would be most elegant just to look at a different tumor and have the same or, or validate it in a functional experiment. Uh, but, um, that's of course a tough question. That's the, that's, that's the most important thing of all. You get different pipelines, different, you can program it in R, you can bioconductor, whatever. There are so many things available. It just needs to be plausible. You have to have some inherent positive control. For topic dermatitis, it's a bit easier. I mean, you know the signature that you expect. There's gonna be lots of TH2 inflammation going on. So the baseline characteristics are there. You should have some correlation of CCL17 with overall disease activity. Um, I mean, interleukin-13 should be produced by T, help, uh, by T cells. If you find that, if you find something different, you need to maybe have discovered something enormously new, but you also, of course, need to be very careful about it. Uh, so you need to have, look at it from different angles. Also with your quality control, you all, we always go back and forth, be less stringent at the beginning, then look at the data and then go back. This is of course the risk that you now do data picking, yeah? And then you, you, know, you, you do it as long as you get a significant result. I mean, this is of course, um, this is of course a danger, but it's, it, it's, there's no, there's no, clear recipe for it, but it's, it's about um, validating it with other, uh, from, other, from multiple angles. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Just, we, we, we have a question uh, probably interesting from uh, Jeremy Didomidio, probably related to his uh, recent paper published. It's uh, based, uh, based on the fact that viscous fluids contain many neutrophils. However, as you show, um, it seems to be Capture, not really captured by the single cell arena data. So do you have any explanation about that? The trivial explanation is we think they just fall apart. They're not stable enough. They are lost during the process. Um, so um, I think neutrophils are very hard to capture. I think um, we, I don't really know it, but I think the neutrophils are just um, crap falling apart during the process because they're sensitive to to, to, to especially the fax sorting as we think. So there are some cells that are really robust and work better and others are less uh, robust. Good to know. Yes. That's, I mean, that's my educated guess. I don't have proof for it, but it's just, they're just not there. Yeah, it's an interesting question. We, ha we have got another practical question, which is, which is I think relevant for many who are doing uh, research with this technique. So it's regarding tissue storage and dissociation protocols. So how should the tissue be stored when performing dissociation at a later stage? And is it possible to perform single cell RNA sequencing on cryopreserved skin? You can do it on cryopreserved skin. Um, we compared um, cells that we dissociated and then have frozen it like on a single cell suspension and then did fax sorting and looked for single cell RNA sequencing, but the quality was not good. We also did cells. Um, you can also look at the T cell receptor and really lots of information was 
I think gone after a few months of storage. So I would try to do it as freshly as possible. I mean, of course you can then wait for um, rare samples and then process it all together. Our experience is it works better if you immediately process it on a, a consistent basis and not store them too long or not freeze them at all. I think that's much better in our hands. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe it's two o'clock. Uh, we have probably to, need, we need to conclude. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, Patrick, for this excellent talk. Um, there is, we see that there is many questions. Uh, so probably uh, all these questions you can uh, uh, ask again and uh, they will be posted. Uh, Chris, the final words, I'll let you. Yeah, well, thank you so much, uh, Patrick. That was really, truly excellent um, addition to our recipe book. And we'll be keeping that one in the kitchen for sure. And as um, Julianne uh, mentioned, you know, there'll be the opportunity hopefully for you to answer some of the questions we weren't able to get to um, online. So thank you particularly to Eniko and Julian for chairing things so well. And also to my colleague, Eli Sprecher, who's a fellow board member who is really the spearhead of this whole program. So our next um, webinar, next journey into the kitchen is in two weeks time on the 30th of September. Uh, this is the molecular cuisine. Sounds it's exciting. It is exciting. It's a, a personal journey by um, Alan Taib and Muriel Carrio Andre from Bordeaux about um, pathology of skin pigmentation. So, at the same time in two weeks' time, um, be very good to see you see you back online with the webinar. So enjoy the rest of your day and thanks for joining. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.